For this last video on string methods, I'm going to show you a little bit about converting between strings and lists. The methods that are in this group convert between a string and some composite data type by either pasting objects together to make a string or by breaking a string apart into its pieces. These methods operate on or return iterables. Iterable is a general Python term for a sequential collection of objects. Iterating or walking through all the members of a collection is a common technique done inside Python. I will include links below this video for more information about Python iterables. Many of these methods return either a list or a tuple, which are very similar collections of ordered objects, but they have a couple differences. A list is enclosed within square brackets, and it's mutable, meaning that the contents can change, whereas a tuple, also sometimes pronounced tuple, is enclosed within parentheses and is immutable. This is a very quick introduction on these topics, but you need to know a little bit about what they look like for this next set of methods and their examples. Again, as a note, I'll also include more information about lists and tuples below this video. So the first method you're gonna try is dot join, which takes an iterable into it. It concatenates strings from that iterable. To start, I'll have you create a list. A list is contained within square brackets. This list will be a sequence of strings. Make sure to open and close each string object with a single quote or double quote and place a comma in between the objects. So now you've created my list and you can check its type. It is a class list. How can you use the method join? Well, join works with those iterables. In this case, you can give it a separator. In this case, maybe we'll use, I don't know, Let's try a semicolon and a space. That's your separator, which is a string. And since it's a string, you can see all the methods that are there and join is one of them. And you can see that it'll concatenate any number of strings. So here you can see the example showing joining this list together. So this will be returned as a new string. Let's try it with ours, my list, and see what returns. So it's a single string, again, joined together using this separator. You could have used a comma and left it without a space even. Great. So one kind of interesting thing to think about is that any string is an iterable also. So if you had a string of just a word, and let's say that word is lobster, and right now the type is lobster, it's a string. Okay. What if you were to join, say using a colon, word? It will take all the individual letters that it can be iterated through and create a new string separating them. So one note, if you had a list, and in this case, the list had a mix of types of things, let's say an integer along with a handful of strings. Again, the type is definitely a list. What happens if you were to try using this as your separator and join my list too? This one is saying that there is a problem with it. There's an exception a type error. It expected another string and found an integer instead. So in this case, all three of these would have to be strings in order to do that join. Well, you learned a method earlier that could fix that. In its case, you could say that integer of 23 and have it convert it into a string for us using str. So now, if you were to use my list three, and join it together and not end up with that type error. The next method is partition, which takes a string of a separator. It divides a string based upon that separator. The return value is the three part tuple consisting of the portion preceding the separator, the separator itself, and the portion of the string following that separator. Let's say we had a string with egg and spam in a period separating the two. With partition, it's gonna separate it into three parts given a specific separator. So let's say our separator in this case is a period. It's gonna return three tuples containing the part before the separator, the separator itself, and the part after it. Okay, we'll see what that looks like. And there you go. Again, you can see the parentheses as opposed to the square brackets indicating this is a tuple and not a list. Kinda of neat. If you were to have a longer string with these three 
word separated with dollar signs, how would partition work here? Oh, T is our new string. So in this case, if you added the double dollar sign, partition made the partition based upon the first occurrence of that string. Our partition divides a string based upon a separator again. It functions exactly like partition, except that the string is split at the last occurrence instead of the first occurrence of the separator. So starting from the right, like the other R methods you've learned earlier. So our partition would do the same thing, but it would work from the right side. If you were to take T and partition it based on something that's not within the string, like let's say a period, it would simply return the entire string and then an empty string followed by another empty string in your tuple. So here's your string T. And T, our partition, if you were to use a character that's not in the string, would do the reverse. Again, partition works from the left and our partition working from the right. Next is split. It splits a string into a list of substrings. Without any arguments, split will take your string and divide it into substrings delimited by any sequence of white space. It will return those substrings as a list. If a separator is specified, it will be used for delimiting the split. The max split value by default is negative one, which will mean it will split all the way across the entire string. But if a value is put inside max split, it will start from the left side and count up. So in this case, here's a string with words separated by white space, in this case, just the space character. If you were to apply split to it, as you can see here, without a separator, the default value is going to split based upon any white space and discard empty strings from the result. So let's try split just by itself. And you can see it returns this list, separating all the words based upon the white space between them. And that white space could be tabs, new lines, or simply just plain old space. If you have a string that uses a period as a separator, split in that case, if you were to enter in the value, will split based upon that, using that delimiter. If you have something kind of unique with multiple periods, if you were to split this using that as the delimiter, it will return empty strings as part of your list. So there would be a little string there, another string there. It's still splitting based upon that delimiter. Just be aware if you have repeating characters, that's how it would behave. Another quick note, if you had a string had multiple characters of white space in between your words, In that case, even though these are repetitions, it will just take it all as one chunk of white space in between. Do one more example here. Create a string named link with real python.com inside of it. And in this case, take that link and split it. The delimiter is period, sure, but this time let's put in the value for max split. Let's say the maximum splits are only one. That would take it from the left side here www.realpython.com and separate the two out. Our split works the same as split. The only thing that has changed is the max split value is counted from the right side. So try out your same link and this time try our split with it. And you can see that it shows almost the entire same information except for it's going to split starting from the end with a max split of one. And there you can see the separation starting with the last period. In all other ways, our split behaves the same as split. And in the case of the default, meaning the max split is set to negative one, both methods behave exactly the same. Split lines will take a long string and break it based upon line boundaries. 
it will return them as a list. Any of the following characters or character sequences included in this table is considered to be a line boundary. It could be new line, a carriage return, or any of these other escape sequences included inside here with their Unicode or ASCII equivalents. If the optional keep ends argument is set to true, it will include those line ending characters. If you have a large text input that's been read in from a file, very often they'll have new line escape sequences inside of it. It might look something like this. This is a excerpt from Moby Dick. Instead of typing this out, you can copy it from the text below this video. And you can see here at each line, there's a line break slash n, make a new variable, call it Moby split. And we'll take Moby after splitting it into lines. And note, the line breaks will not be included in the resulting list unless you set that optional argument to true. So basically you're taking this text, applying this method to it, and then putting that into this new variable Moby split. So what does that look like? Well, Moby split is a list, as you can see here, and each one of these text strings separated by a comma. And the same way that you can access portions of a string, you can access this list. So this would be the first line in this case, or in the case of here, we could say, oh, give me the second line. So it's pretty powerful what you can do with split lines if you have this large chunk of text and how you could access it later as an iterable list instead. Now that you covered the majority of string methods, it's time to talk about bytes, starting in section three.